This module on academic success explores the memory process and learning tools. We believe that understanding the memory process will give insight into how to study more effectively throughout your educational pursuits. During the module, we'll share information about how your learning is affected by the memory process. We'll start with the basics of learning. The dictionary defines learning as the acquisition of knowledge or skills through experience, study, or by being taught. What we learn, how much we learn, and how we learn, however, depends upon how we respond to the prompts and opportunities we have to acquire more skills and knowledge. Learning encompasses remembering, understanding, applying, analyzing, evaluating, and creating. In 1956, psychologist Benjamin Bloom described these levels of learning with his hierarchy of cognitive skills known as Bloom's taxonomy. This hierarchy ranges from lower order levels of thinking, such as remembering specific facts and terminology, what some people may describe as surface level learning, to higher order levels of thinking, like evaluating ideas and creating new ideas or material, which requires deeper learning and will enable you to teach the material. When we talk about critical thinking and blooms, it is important to pay attention to what you're learning. Using higher level thinking skills, such as evaluation, requires students to have a strong base knowledge for the subject matter. Performing well on an essay test, for example, requires you to know and understand the course terminology and concepts, and to synthesize ideas from the text and lecture. Without that foundational knowledge, you will not know enough material to evaluate the situation. Learning outcomes for courses often require students to apply themselves beyond what's covered in lecture. The instructor may not be able to cover all of the material during the lecture, and thus the students must delve into the text for supplementary information. Memory and its use in studying is key to student success. We believe that understanding the memory process will entice you to develop stronger study habits that will help you learn material consistently throughout the term. We will look at three types of memory, sensory memory, short-term or working memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory holds information in sensory form for a few seconds. To then move the information into short-term memory, we must give it attention. If we don't, the information is lost. Attention is about focusing. With more information in the environment and in your textbook than you can process at one time, it is your responsibility to make choices about what to focus on. Limiting distractions and controlling the study environment is crucial to this process. While you may think that watching TV as you're reading for class will help you study, your brain is actually being forced to shift its attention from the TV to the book. Multitasking is but a myth. Research shows that when you try to perform two tasks at the same time, performance on one is detrimental to performance on the second. You wouldn't want your reading and understanding of the material to suffer because your attention was dedicated to the TV. And likewise, by trying to divide your attention between your favorite TV show and your schoolwork, it's inevitable that you'll miss sections of the storyline. Working memory is only useful when you're actively thinking about the material. In order to use that information later, you'll need to transfer it to your long-term memory. In order to encode information and move it from the working memory to the long-term memory, we need to rehearse it. The long-term memory helps store information for extended periods of time, but when we don't rehearse it, the information gets lost through memory decay. Try to encode the information in a variety of ways. Encoding in a variety of ways means you're moving beyond rote memorization and diversifying your study activities. Some students choose to study based on already established learning styles, but we encourage you to go further. Though you may prefer a specific study method, you may find out that you're more effective if you approach your studies in different ways. Reading helps you learn about new ideas, and flashcards can quiz your memorization. But studying can incorporate more than these two activities. Try talking aloud, writing, drawing a diagram, quizzing yourself, and working in study groups. When you add this variety to your studying, you'll encode information in more ways and you'll have more pathways by which to retrieve the information. Diversifying the encoding process is essential to retrieval, which is the process of actually remembering information when you want to. As mentioned earlier, the more ways you are able to encode information, the more ways you can retrieve information. So when you're taking a test, for example, and need to retrieve something for the multiple choice question or the essay question, you can because you've diversified your encoding process and also rehearsed the material. 
It can be discouraging how quickly we can forget information. Within a few minutes, we can forget up to half of what we studied. However, we can counteract this tendency to forget by utilizing rehearsal and repetition. Herbin Ebbinghaus addressed this in 1885 when he described the forgetting curve, which is the rate at which we forget information over time if it is not repeated. Ebbinghaus advocated for overlearning and revisiting material through repetition and practice. Think about this with real life examples. The more times you hear song lyrics, the more likely you are to remember their message. Rep repetition strengthens your memorization of that information and improves the amount of information you'll remember. This is why we don't recommend cramming. Cramming before a test doesn't leave time between study sessions for memory consolidation, and it creates a level of stress that may compromise your attention and focus. An effective alternative to cramming is to space out your studying with a method known as distributed practice. Distributed practice allows our brains the time needed to consolidate information between study sessions. Feist and Rosenberg attribute this to the important role sleep plays in stabilizing and enhancing the memory. Dunlowski and colleagues found that when students held study sessions that were short and spread out over time, they had higher accuracy and better recall for the information as compared to information studied during single, longer study sessions. At OSU, we're on a quarter system with an 11-week term. One effective approach to distributed practice would be to revisit prior course content or material weekly. Let's use a chemistry course as an example. You have your chemistry midterm, week 5 of the term, and your cumulative final, week 11. You wouldn't want to wait until week 5 or week 11 to revisit the material from week 1. Instead, consider building weekly review of prior material and topics into your study sessions. As a general rule, try spending 80% of your chemistry study time during week 2 on new material from that week, and 20% of your time doing review problems or practicing test questions from week 1 material. The following week, you'll spend 80% of your time on new material and 20% reviewing information from weeks 1 and 2. The big takeaway we hope you get from this section is to spread out your studying over time. When you cram, you don't leave enough time to learn the material and transfer it to long-term memory. Giving yourself more time to process and repeat the information will help you better prepare and be confident with your tests. Now we're going to talk about how to design study sessions. When you're designing study sessions, it is important to pay attention to the surrounding environment because it will either enhance or interfere with your learning. Choosing the right location for your study sessions matters. Whether you choose to study in the library, your room, or in a coffee shop, you must be aware of the space around you and how the environment impacts your attention and learning. If the space doesn't allow you to focus, you aren't setting yourself up to have a very successful study session. It's also important to limit distractions while you study. Sitting in the library writing messages to your friend may be just as distracting as studying at home where your neighbor comes to chat with you every five to 10 minutes. Another part of designing your study sessions is establishing the goals and outcomes you want for these sessions. Write down your goals. When studying for the chemistry class, for example, you can have a goal to read the chapter and take notes for the first two hours and then spend your third hour solving practice problems at the end of the chapter. To stay on track for this study session, you'll have to check in with yourself to see if you're completing what you need. After 45 minutes of studying, you can schedule a break, during which you'll check to see if you're on track to meet your goal and to get up to stretch your legs, fill your water bottle, or check in with a friend about plans for the weekend. If your study sessions are longer, like the one described here, it's important to make sure you have short mental breaks to rejuvenate and get the blood flowing to your brain. Taking short breaks when you're studying may help you with your concentration and memory processing. This figure shows the concentration cycle. At the beginning of your study period, you have about five minutes of light concentration. This is followed by five more minutes of moderate concentration before you head into the 40 minutes of deep concentration when you will become engrossed in your study session. Following those 40 minutes, you can take a break before beginning the process again. The second figure shows the difference between the ideal study session, which follows the concentration cycle, and more common study sessions, which often have more interruptions and lower levels of concentration. Finding the right space and setting for your study session may take a few trial periods, but once you find the environment that works for you, you'll be able to engage in your study sessions with less distractions and fewer interruptions. 
We've talked about how to distribute your time to increase learning and memory, and how to set up your environment to help you learn and focus your attention. Now it's time to discuss different activities to help you learn. There are many different ways to study and learn information. While many of us have adapted study activities that we rarely stray from, utilizing a variety of study activities will help us process the information into our memories in different ways. Taking notes, for example, provide information to our working memories. However, we must then rehearse that information when preparing for tests and exams in order to begin its encoding process and be able to recall it. As you see here, we've broken apart the study activities between the initial learning and the reviewing and self-testing. After you read or take notes on the material, you will want to revisit the information and recite the concepts you learn each week. Repeating the information will help encode it into your memory and as mentioned previously, the more ways you encode information, the more ways you'll be able to retrieve the information on a test. Now that we have completed the module, we invite you to think about the following question. How can I use what I've learned about the memory process and learning tools to improve the way I study? Thank you for joining us for this memory process and learning tools module. Please visit our website at success.oregonstate.edu slash learning hyphen corner for more information and study tips.